Okay, hi everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the nonprofits. Well, we had a moment of silence. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll have several direct parts of the show as we run out of things to say. But this show is Us? brought to you. Oh no, no, no! That's yeah, we not. always do. We always do. <laughs> Uh, this show is brought to you by the Atheist Community of Austin. I'm your host, Jeff D. My co-hosts are Vic Farrow and Mary McManamy. Hi, folks. Hey! Hi. And our producer is Russell Glasser. Hello! Today's <laughs> opening music was Time Out for Fun by Devo. No heavy musical message this week, folks. Uh, just, uh, just fun. We are live January 26, 2002. The Atheist Community of Austin is a non-profit educa educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. We have weekly meetings Sunday mornings at the Hot Jumbo Bagel Shop at 307 West 5th Street at 10.30 a.m., except for the first Sunday of each month when we have our lecture series at 11 a.m. in the Longhorn Room of Furs Cafeteria at North Cross Mall. Our next lecture will be on February 3rd. Mary, you set that up. Would you care to announce what's going to be happening at sure, that lecture? Sure, sure. I'd be glad to. Professor John Rumrich, he's a UT professor of uh, Renaissance Literature, uh, and for those who are listening uh, overseas, we hope, and, and in other areas outside of Austin, that is the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and basically, he's going to be talking about the play Samson Agonistes. It's Milton's tragic poem. And uh, so anybody who can come out to that, please do so. Uh, it would also help if you could print out a copy or get a copy of John Milton's poem, Samson Agonistes, before the lecture. I got mine. Yes. I, I, I won't kid you. It's not an easy read, but uh, please do give it a try. You know, we don't expect anybody to have it memorized or anything like that. But just <laughs> sort of, you know, read a synopsis. Also, you might want to check out Judges chapters 13 through 17 in the Bible. Uh, which is basically the story of Samson and Delilah. Can so. I just get the cliff notes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, <know> this. <laughs> I You know, a lot of people may want to do that, and that's that's fine. Are there even cliff notes on this? <laughs> Somewhere, but you know, it's interesting. I, now that you mentioned it, I haven't found any, but I'm sure they're out there somewhere. I, I noticed that the uh, th this is a this is a play in the form of a big poem. That's right. Of, and I noticed that it's the every place I've seen it posted on the internet it's uh the like every tenth line is numbered mm -hmm. is the is this professor going to be referring to different places <laughs> i mean is that is that a, a tool for people studying the the poem to indeed quick reference indeed is a quick reference okay. um i but he told me that he is not basically he's going to start with a with a basically a historical background of milton and you know, the context, basically, in which Milton wrote this poem from a historical perspective. And then he's going to talk about the poem itself. But again, uh, you know, understands that maybe not everybody's going to have a copy of it. You know, we hope that most people can print a copy before they come to the lecture. I mean, that's the ideal situation. Uh, but again, he's not going to stand up there and read. He's a fabulous lecturer. Uh, I didn't know a thing about Milton when I took his class, and that's exactly why I took his class, was mm -hmm. because I wanted to know about Milton and his poems. Right. And he is just fabulous. Again, his name's John Rumrich, and he'll be at Furs Cafeteria in Austin, Texas, for our uh, for the ACA's lecture series on February 3rd. Mm -hmm. at, uh, basically, if you get there at 11, that would be good, because right. that's when they open. <laughs> right, that's when the doors to, <laughs> yeah. to, to Furs open. I, yeah. I misread the, the, the title of the email when it first came out. I was thinking it said Samson Agnostics, and I'm like, what? Uh -huh. I just think it's like, <laughs> Samson, what? Samson, what? Samson wasn't an agnostic. Yeah. Well, that, that you, you, you've certainly challenged us this time around at uh, at our lecture series. I, I hope that enough of us uh, atheists, we are supposed to be the smart people. I hope enough of us step to the plate. I do too. Uh, I do too. And uh, you know, and and, and uh, give this a serious listen um, to make it worth uh, worth doing. Uh, Absolutely. And just a little background, um, just the beauty of Milton's words. Uh, one of his poems he wrote uh, was called On the Death of a Fair Infant Dying of a Cough. And basically Milton ingeniously summarizes death in the first line of the poem. He says, O fairest flower, no sooner blown but blasted. Mm. And and that's uh, just, just to give you a little teaser. <laughs> so okay. so right. come on out. It's a great lecture. You'll enjoy it. Okay. Well, cool. Uh, thanks very much for setting that up. Yeah. ACA board meetings take place at 10 a.m. right before our regular meeting on the second Sunday of every month. That's again at the uh, the bagel shop. Uh, the 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 board meetings are open to all ACA members, but you can only vote if you're on the board of directors. And the next next board meeting is on February 10. The Godless Gamers meet every Monday night at 7 p.m. at my place. 
ACA Happy Hour is at Antonio's near Highway 35 and 183 every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Again, this is Austin, Texas we're talking about. If you get there and don't see anybody else around, hang hang out because uh, people trickle in as the night goes on. Um, I haven't been to Happy Hour lately, but uh, I understand they're still, they're still, still going strong. Yeah. <laughs> For more information, you can call our voicemail at three. Uh, excuse me, 512 512- Three seven one two nine one one, or visit our website at www.atheist-community.org, where we also have past episodes of this fine audio program Yay! you're listening to right now, Yay, available Nova! for download. <laughs> uh, and you'll get the entire opening and closing music uh, from that, <laughs> instead of get, having it cut off in the middle of the beginning and the end, like uh, like it does uh, on the broadcast. Uh, let's see. Oh, didn't also hear it last week. The end that, of the, they didn't even hear yeah, that's right. We cut off before we even got to the music last time. Oh, well. Um, uh, just a reminder for any of you listening to us out there in Internet land, if you go to www.atheistnetwork.com and click on the chat link, you will find yourself in a chat room full of all kinds of cool people listening to our cool audio show. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can chat with folks there about what we're talking about. We monitor that chat room and occasionally take uh, questions and comments from there. Uh, so it's especially keen, and you might want to check that out. Once again, www.atheistnetwork.com uh, and click on the chat link. Any instances of slurs, defamation, or discrimination against atheists or other non believers in the U.S. media can be reported to the National Atheist Ombuds by emailing ombuds at atheism.org. Uh, just, uh, just a note from the chat room. Yeah. Uh, we're having server problems again, and Infidel Guy says it's because a friend of theirs has traced a hack attempt to some Christian service. Really? Yeah. Okay, but what, what does that mean? What exactly is Are we losing this happened, audio this stream? This has or happened what? more than once. Uh, apparently, we're cutting in and out some of the time. Mm. Uh, I've already posted the link for rebroadcast, okay. which is, again, atheist-community.org slash radio.htm. Uh, that will go up after today's show. Another excellent example of the uh, Christian objection to the concept of free speech. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, it's only so free speech as long as you're promoting what they think. If, we, right. if this was the media, you could report this incident to the National Atheist Ombuds by email. Yeah. <laughs> ombuds at atheism.org. Um, include, uh, your email should include as many details as possible and a news source where applicable. Incidents will be reported to participating national and local non-theist organizations who have agreed to distribute press releases regarding the reported subject matter. This is a very important anti-defamation effort for atheists. Uh, Sorry, everybody out there, I cannot stress strongly enough how important that is for us to uh, rally together to protect our own rights. Uh, Edwin Kagan, attorney, published author, former college English instructor, Presbyterian minister's son, Eagle Scout, founding member of the Free Inquiry Group, Inc. of Cincinnati and North Kentucky, and director of Camp Quest, the first residential summer camp for the children of atheists, humanists, and other freethinkers, has agreed to engage in a live debate on the issue of whether or not there is a God. Exact wording of the debate topic, not yet chosen. This debate will take place on Wednesday, January 30. Wow, that's Wednesday, right? at 7 p.m. in room 128 of Pearson Hall at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Boy, that's a <laughs> that's a tossed salad of locations. Miami University, Oxford, Ohio. Ohio. The debate will be hosted by the Forensics Department, and it is jointly sponsored by the Organization of Atheists and Agnostics of Miami University and by a Christian fraternity. Speaking for the existence of God will be Dr. Ben Voth, Director of Forensics and Professor of the Department of Communication of Miami University. Dr. Voth appears to be a formidable opponent. He is a debate judge at the national level and the advisor and coach for the Miami University Forensic Debate Team, which is performed with distinction in national and international tournaments. That sounds awfully exciting for those of you in Ohio. There is is a a (laughs) problem with these debates is that... uh, they're always set up and rigged by these Christian groups that so that you know, there's no way to get out of it without looking bad. It's a stacked deck against anybody who's uh, uh, going for the, uh, the non-creation side. Oh yeah, and I've seen I've seen firsthand when I was with the University Skeptical Society at UT and we were arranging a debate with a local Christian group. Um, 
the there are all kinds of battles to be fought before you even start the debate, right? There's the exact wording of the topic is important, right? These guys that the Skeptic Society was arguing with wanted the topic to be uh is Christianity reasonable? Mm. Right? They wanted to soften this the topic to the point mm-hmm. where it was hardly even worth arguing over. Right, it really wanted something more meaty, like mm-hmm. is there a God? Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, is the does the Bible have a bunch of contradictions? Something something clear and definitive that we could discuss um, instead of this sort of wishy washy. You know, <laughs> are you gonna should should people be mean to Christians? Or, uh, title. <laughs> well, and uh, should be mean to them, yeah. but that doesn't but, but mean that's the way they were positioning. That was the way they were yeah. positioning the wording of the topic. Uh, and then there's the question of who speaks first. Because, uh-huh. you know, who, depending on, on who's on the offense and who's on the defense, who gets the first word in makes a huge difference. And uh, that all got wrangled back and forth, and um, uh, it was, it, they, they were very, they were very uh, difficult to work with and, uh, and, and fighting very hard to get things all set up to their advantage. Uh, and, uh, and we nearly backed out. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, hmm. where was where were we? Oh, okay. Uh, Third International Rationalist Conference. Boy, not going to be announcing this too many more times, folks. Uh, so far, so good. There has not yet been a big war between India and Pakistan. So, uh, so so far, the International Rationalist Conference is still on. That's uh, in New Delhi, India, February eight to twelve, two thousand two. Address your correspondence to the Third International Rationalist Conference at conference at rationalistinternational.net. Or for more information, visit www.rationalistinternational.net. There will be a creation creation evolution debate on February 15 at 6:30 p.m. in on the UT campus. That's uh, University of Texas again, right here in Austin, in UTC 2.112A. Tickets are five dollars. This event was organized by members of Helping Austin Area Schools, a registered student organization at the University of Texas at Austin, with concerns about the quality of science education in our public schools. They are expecting mostly Christians in the audience, and therefore have expended, extended a special invitation to unbelievers in the Austin area. Another uh, one of their tactics is to stack the audience so that... You know. Yeah, yeah. I for, I, for one, intend to be here uh, mm-hmm. uh, on the uh, atheist side. Uh, for information on getting tickets, email Doug Keller. His email address is pogi at mail.utexas.edu. That's P-O-U-G-I-E at mail.utexas.edu. Free Thinkers and Atheists of Virginia is a new atheist group uh, forming in the fine state of Virginia. More information can be found at www.atheistdominion.org. Uh, they will be meeting at the Virginia Beach Central Library, 4100 Virginia Beach Boulevard, between Independence Boulevard and Rosemont Road. Uh, the first meeting will be on January 27. What is today? Today, that's, that's tomorrow. Today's, yeah, yeah. tomorrow. Tomorrow, first meeting uh, from 1 to 3 p.m. in the auditorium of the Virginia Beach Central Library. Uh, the second meeting will be on February 16, and the third on March 17. Uh, and uh, it's not always the same room, so you probably want to go to that web address for full info. Hmm. And more activities! Man, it's just a uh, heyday for atheism hmm. now. Democracy Rising Rally in Austin. The atheist community of Austin will have a booth at a rally organized by Ralph Nader's new Democracy Rising organization. Nader will be speaking along with Molly Ivins and Jim Hightower and other special guests, and entertainment will be provided by Jackson Brown and Patty Smith. The Woo-hoo! event takes place at 7 p.m., doors open at 5.30, at the Tony Burgess Center. That's Burger. T- Burger. Yeah. Tony Burger Center. Burger. Yeah. B-U-R-G-E-R? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tony, is this spelling of Tony correct then? Because it's weird. No. T-O-N-E-Y? It's just Tony. Yeah, T-O-N-E-Y. T-O-N-E-Y. Yeah. Tony Burger Center, just like it sounds. <clears throat> 3200 Jones Road in Austin. For tickets and other info, call 512-482-0404. I happen to know the tickets are $15 at at the door. Uh, But if you know somebody who's got a booth there, they've got tickets to sell you for $10. Eat More Christians t-shirts are still available (laughs) from CafePress.com. The full URL is www.CafePress.com slash NoGods. These are t-shirts featuring a parody of the Chick-fil-A 
uh, uh, fast food chain commercial uh, featuring three lions holding up placards that say, eat more Christians. As opposed to the cows. As opposed to their cows. Saying right. eat more chicken. That is a that is a fundamentalist Christian fast food chain, yeah. and we're just poking a little fun at them. All proceeds from the sale of these t-shirts will go to the cost of running and promoting this here fine program. Uh, also want to remind everyone of our nonprofit's reminder list. If you've enjoyed our show and would like to receive emails reminding you to tune in live each week and chat with other listeners uh, between shows, uh, y- uh, you can join the reminder list by going to groups.yahoo.com slash group slash atheist underscore non dash profits radio show. Whew. That was, a, that was a mouthful. Have we got that post on our website? Uh, not yet. Let's get that posted on the website. Not ASAP. yet on the web, but watch for it. And we want to give uh, Wendy Britton a big hand Yay! for volunteering to set that up and moderating it. Wendy is a former ACA member, now moved up to the fine state of Washington, yes. where I understand some crazy nonsense is going on. Oh, yes, indeed. We'll, <laughs> we'll get to that. Well, let's do that Are you now. Ready to segue? <laughs> yeah. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> I hope you know about this. Olympia, Washington, I believe is where this started. But anyway, Washington State. We'll leave it at that for now until I get my facts straight. Okay, this is, can somebody explain this to me? Uh, we've got some anti-evolution legislation that's been introduced. Uh, according, this is, uh, this little synopsis is from the National Center for Science Education, defending the teaching of evolution in the public schools. Um, According to the bill's digest, this is Senate Bill 6500, which was proposed by Senator Hochstatter. Um, His first name is Harold. It's Harold Hochstatter. The bill says, quote, finding that the teaching of the theory of evolution in the common schools of the state of Washington is repugnant to the principles of the Declaration of Independence and thereby unconstitutional and unlawful. What did the, con- what did the <laughs> Declaration of Independence say about evolution in the first place? And in the second place, what does the Declaration of Independence have to do with lawfulness? I know, I know. Yeah. And it gets worse. It gets worse. And we, ta- we were talking about this before the show. We've got this. Okay, this is from the actual text of the bill, folks. This is Senate Bill 6500. In you can this- look it up yourself. It's www. <laughs> Ledge, which is actually L-E-G, so www.leg.wa.gov. This is Senate Bill 6500, and the text reads, quote, The Declaration of Independence declares the self-evident truth that all men are created. Created period? Created period. Does yeah, that not in fact say something about <laughs> created people? Created people? Uh, yes, yes I believe so. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> so you just cut it off after the word yeah. people, which is missing the point entirely of yes. what the Declaration of Independence, Independence was trying to say. Hmm. Of course, the people who drafted the Declaration of Independence did believe in a god. Didn't mo- Most of them did not happen to believe in the Christian god, but... Uh, they did believe in a God. They did think that people were created, but their point in that sentence was that we all had equal rights. Right. And so... Not just the Christians. And so folks. Senator <laughs> Hochstatter in the state of Washington, this is a, he's a state senator, right? Yes. Yeah, he's a state, state senator in, yeah. in Washington. Uh, Washington State. <laughs> right. Uh, he's, he's, he's spinning that in order to promote his right. agenda of turning non-Christians into second-class citizens. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay. With you Isn't so far. That's sweet. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so, you know, uh, as as part of this discussion, I also wanted to get kind of the um, the, the stickle side, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a, uh, a little blurb from a guy named Michael Shermer. I'm sure a lot of people already have heard of him. I have not, but he's the executive editor of Skeptic Magazine. He's also an adjunct assistant professor uh, for Occidental College. Yeah, but he won't call himself an atheist because he's a big weenie. He won't. I didn't realize that. He he also makes the claim... Smart, clever fellow, has a lot of good things to say, won't call himself an atheist because he's a big weenie. In his book, How We Believe, he he makes the point that atheism is just as untenable as uh, as, uh, fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. No, sorry, dude. Wrong. Mm. He doesn't believe in a god. He's an atheist, but he won't use the word because he, he, uh, he's, he's a big scared weird. of the A word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, he still makes a pretty interesting point here about the education issue, and uh-huh. I'd like to just share that real quick. 
that he oh, first even, mentions... Even big weenies can have yeah, very important has... things to say. <laughs> don't, don't take that as a comment yeah. that we should not listen to, to what he has to say on this topic of legality. <laughs> <laughs> so, big weenie remarks says, okay, first he introduces the, the, the uh, creationist perspective, and this is their argument. Since education is a process of learning on all sides of an issue, it is appropriate for both creationism and evolution to be taught side by side in public school classrooms. Not to do so is a violation of the philosophy of education and of the civil liberties of creationists. So again, it sounds like Mr. Hoshdatter here, Senator oh, uh, Hoshdatter from over like, in Washington. Uh, it, it oh, seems go ahead. like people's audio is catching up because the oh, uh, infidel guy just mentioned that Michael Shermer called himself an atheist on political. Did he? Right? Good for him. Yeah. Good for him. No longer a weenie. All right. All right. Yay. 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 He's, He's been de-weenified. De <laughs> <laughs> All right, I take it back. <laughs> good. That's good to know. That's good to know. Uh, it, so basically, that's you know that's the creationist perspective that that Mr. Shermer set up. And then he, he refutes that by saying the multiple sides of issues is indeed a part of the general educational process, and it might be appropriate to discuss creationism in courses on religion, history, or even philosophy, but most certainly not science. Any more than biology courses should include lectures on American Indian creation myths. Not to do so violates no rights, since nowhere in nature or the Constitution does it say everyone has a right to teach creationism in public schools. Rights do not exist in nature. Rights are a concept constructed by humans to protect certain freedoms, but have degenerated into pleas for special privilege by nearly every group and individual in America who wants something they do not have. Right. So, again, I, I think that's an excellent point. And I think, you know, let me go ahead and give this web address to, uh, to Russell. Uh, this is basically, this web address that I'm handing to Russell is uh, geosociety.org. Uh, but it's the Geological Society of America. That's where you can find Mr. Skir Mr. Shermer's 25 creationist arguments and 25 evolutionist answers. As frustrating as it can be, you should read the entire URL because not everybody listening to the show is okay. in the chat room. Okay, well, in the, that's true. Okay, let me go ahead and do that. It's HTTP, okay, W, you know that part. <laughs> it's See, what did I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate doing this. I know, I know, but we got it. Okay. <laughs> it's www.geosociety.org, that geosociety is one word, slash critical issues, all one word, slash ev underscore the number 10 dot htm pound as in the number pound sign, pound yeah. sign b i b as in bib <laughs> so it's a long one but i'll read again www.geosociety.org slash critical issues slash ev underscore number 10 dot htm pound bib <laughs> okay great <laughs> okay awesome so uh, uh and that's that's where uh, uh michael Shermer's comments are Posted, right? Yes, exactly. And the Geological Michael Society... Michael Shermer, not a weenie. Not a weenie anymore. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. The, the Shermer, formerly known as weenie. <laughs> um, and, yeah, the Geological Society of America is a fabulous site for both people who are believers and non-believers, because they do present both sides. So for the people out there who are interrupting our broadcast, thank you very much. We want you to know that we do you know, have a certain amount of respect, even though we disagree with you. So, again, please stop interrupting yeah. everybody's broadcast. Because we respect you're... the rights you actually have. That's not, right. We just don't respect your freedom to claim to have rights that you don't actually have. That's right. So. All right. So uh, so what else does uh, does Herr Hofstetter have to say? <laughs> oh. oh. Over there in Washington. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm... he had that one coming. My dander's up now. <laughs> yeah. Herr Hofstetter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no offense to our German friends out there. This is just obviously. Yeah, I know. Then I, I, know, we I know, know. We know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But yeah. Uh, I've got German blood in me. Yeah. I do too. Uh, we're all the mutts of society, as Bill Murray once so eloquently put it in <laughs> in stripes. <laughs> uh, so what, what else? Okay. Uh, so yeah. So also, uh, Senator Hochstadter, Harold Hochstadter, along with Senators Dan Swecker and Val Stevens of the Washington State Legislature. Uh, are also proposing another bill in addition to uh, 6500, Senate Bill 6500. They're also uh, wanting to do Senate Bill 6058, which would require a message about the theory of evolution in all state purchased science textbooks. 
Now that's relatively mild compared to the other compared one, right? Because the, the other, other one, one he suppose, wants evolution yeah. removed from public schools, in and replaced with creationism. Mm-hmm. <sighs> mm. I don't know. But see, one or the other of these could get through, folks. So pay attention to who you elect <laughs> to these positions. <laughs> I mean, I know that it's difficult considering we all our have our lives to lead. Hold them to accountable when they do stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Hold them to accountability. Hold them to accountability. So, um, I unfortunately I don't have email addresses for these folks for you to send them your comments. But again, if you go to the main uh, legislative page that we read earlier, don't you have a um, uh, www.leg.wa.gov? Um, yeah, I do have a synopsis for. Uh, Senator Hostadter. Okay, it doesn't have an email. It does. No, it does. Oh. It, his email address is Hostat underscore H A. So you can laugh at him. <laughs> no, at leg dot wa dot gov. <laughs> so again, that's Hostat underscore H O C H S T A T. Yes, underscore H A as in ha at leg dot wa dot gov. Okay. But of course, this is no laughing matter, folks. This is really disturbing, you know. Um, Especially for those of you living in the state of Washington. Well, that wasn't yes. the only misquote of the declaration. That they no, made that, in that I'm glad too. you mentioned that. Yeah, uh, we There's, were laughing about this earlier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, just blatantly, number six in Senate Bill 6500. Again, this is relating to the teaching of the theory of evolution in the common schools of the state of Washington. Number six in the bill says both the United States Constitution and the Washington State Constitution were instituted to protect rights endowed by the Creator. So, uh -huh. you know, no, that, no, 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 <laughs> that, the, you know, what was said in the Declaration of Independence is not law in the United States of America. Right. What it says in the Constitution is law. Right. The Constitution only protects exactly what it says it protects, and it never once says. Uh, what was that again? The, uh, oh, account, uh, number six. Institute to protect, to protect rights endowed by the Creator. Yeah. What was the other misquote? We oh, the other read? thing is the other thing is he says that governments are accountable both to the Creator and to the people. No. As a matter of fact, our government is is accountable only to the people, and never anywhere in any legal document of the United States does it say we are accountable to some imaginary space pixie. <laughs> never. All right. Um, Which kind of leads us to Harry Potter. I <laughs> know. <laughs> Speaking well, of imaginary space pictures, <laughs> and uh, horrible well, danger they pose for our society. I got, uh, you, you said there was a new atheist uh, group in Virginia. Yeah. Well, there's also uh, a ruling in a uh, federal judge has ruled that the saying of grace before the dinner at the state-supported Virginia Military Institute is unconstitutional. Woo! The American Civil Liberties Union uh, instituted a... Uh, sued the Institute last May on behalf of two cadets who complained. Judge Norman K. Moon, at, <laughs> uh, the federal district court held that, quote, because the prayers are drafted and recited at the direction of the Institute's superintendent, the result is that government has become impermissibly entangled with religion, end quote. So the institution is said that it will discontinue prayers immediately. So there's yeah, something it's, it's in Virginia. Getting, it's getting very clear, uh, a very clear precedent, it seems to have been established, that if the religion at a government facility is directly, like, uh, composed and presented by the representatives of that institution, then you're over the line. Right. So most of the fights, it seems to me, nowadays are over, you know, oh, well, the, it's what the kids want, and the kids wrote it, and the kid presented it. That's not us. That's the kids. Oh, please. <laughs> well, that, that yeah. the arguments are now. Yeah, yeah but uh, we know that um, the that one group, the Christian group, that infects the sporting the sports programs of most Right, Christian school. athletes. Yeah, uh, Fellowship for Christian Athletes, that's what right. it is. I've got a question. If the kids decide that they want to abolish calculus and institute yeah. Sony PlayStation, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what they, they want. That? Right. Yeah. What, if they wanna, what if they want to institute slavery? Right. Yeah. Sure. They vote for that? No. Nope. Mm. Yeah. Well, they can't even vote. They're underage. There you go. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, but on the kids, um, we got some funny stuff about Harry Potter. Oh, boy. <laughs> that one. No. We'll start with this one. Uh, oh. Harry Potter prompts police boycott. <laughs> <laughs> what? Huh? Penryn 
fire and police captain. Apparently they is such a small town that the fire and the police captain is one man. Penrin <laughs> so, is the name of the town? Yeah, okay. Penrin is the name of the town. Robert Fickstorn said that the eight-member uh, force voted unanimously to boy- boycott the 20th running of the triathlon scheduled for September 7th. The police. The now, police. Is the entire police uh, police department yeah. of that town? Yeah, the uh, mm-hmm. uh, it's a volunteer police force of some sort because it's a, such a small town. Uh, quoting the captain, I don't feel right taking our children's minds and teaching them witchcraft. As long as they, we don't stand up, it won't, won't stop. And it's oh, unfortunate oh, that this has to right. Newsflash. <laughs> no witchcraft is taught in the Harry Potter series. No real witchcraft. There's this imaginary witchcraft that Harry Even Potter that is not taught. It's like, it, that's like exactly. saying that this Lord of the Rings teaches you how to sword fight. Right. No. Mm-hmm. It's mentioned, right? right? It's a major element in the story, right. the fictional right. story being being presented. But it is, there is no teaching of how to do magic in the... Uh, and in would, Harry Potter. Not not only because there's no such thing as magic, but also because, in fact, there's, like, it, it, the, the, these incidents that happen in Harry Potter's classes at his imaginary school for wizards are, do right. not constitute entire curriculums on how to do magic spells. It's utter nonsense. Doesn't it make you wonder why people aren't leaping all over Jack and the Beanstalk because he's got some magic beans? Yeah, I don't know. I do not know. know. There's magic. We got magic. But but not only only is there no witchcraft taught in Harry Potter, but if there was, the rights of Wiccans are protected by the same laws that protect Christians in our country, <laughs> and for the police department to refuse to protect this organization that they think is dominated by a religion they don't happen to agree with is the most horrific thing I've ever mm-hmm. heard of in my the nation in, in, the, in the entire history of my nation. Um, yeah. I, on the subject of uh, casting real magic spells, yeah. <laughs> I read a report on um, back in the eighties when they were, when there was this big scare about Dungeons and Dragons. Oh boy! In a court case, this guy stands up and says, "Look, you know, let me show you how magic works in Dungeons and Dragons. Can I cast a spell on you right now?" To to <laughs> so he pulls out a pair of dice, rolls it, and says, "Oh, that didn't work." And she said, "Of course it didn't work. I'm protected by Jesus." <laughs> Her <laughs> I want to go to Vegas with that one. I don't, yeah, know, I don't know how many people out there listening to our show have played role playing games. I, I I come from that industry. I've I've worked there. I design role playing games now. I've got my own little company publishing games and stuff. That it, <laughs> it's just astounding. Just uh, astounding. The, the, the magic in those role playing games are just that die rolls you either do something and it's successful or you do something and the die roll says it's not successful mm. and the game continues oh, amazing wow. uh, it's, right. not, it's not like the uh, the chick tracks where they actually have these little chants they have to, to go off and make the game yeah, yeah there's a, there's a uh, jack chick has got this tract about uh, you know dangerous dungeons or something and the, dark, dun- dark, dark dungeons, dungeons thank you yeah. and the evil uh, the evil black haired witch who's the uh, who's the game master takes a, a player aside and says, you know, oh, Cindy, you've reached the fourth level of experience. <laughs> Time for you to learn how to do real magic. And, uh, you know, and my, my reaction to that is, well, you know, I co-wrote a superhero role-playing game. And I, I just imagine taking a player aside and saying, well, Bobby, you've reached the you know, third level of experience as a superhero. It's time for you to learn how to really fight crime in your underwear. In your underwear. <laughs> what is? Oh. Um, well, what else you got? Uh, it, I got the, our famous uh, Reverend Jack Brock from Alamogordo, New Mexico, uh-huh. who is convinced that Harry Potter is the Antichrist. And now, you're not convinced of this how? Uh, uh, well, Are you reading know, the books? No, he never oh, read the book. He admits not. he's never read the book. Mm. But, you know, he, he knows that that's the, that's the, that uh, Harry Potter is the Antichrist. But uh, we were talking about it earlier, and Harry, Harry Potter is a fictional character, so does this admit that the Antichrist is also a fictional <laughs> character? <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> Quoting um, Jack Brock, Harry Potter is the devil, and he is destroying people. Behind that innocent face is the power of satanic darkness. He has he is a fictional character. <laughs> he hasn't got a face. Now there are pictures drawn of this fictional character. Yes, Radcliffe. 
Daniel Radcliffe. And there's there's the there's the actor that plays uh, him in the films, uh, but that's not Harry Potter. No, that's an actor. The little lightning bolt shaped scar on his forehead. Makeup. <laughs> <laughs> As are the horns on every like movie version of Satan you've ever seen. They're fake. Yes. Oh, oh, but those goblins, they're real. <laughs> oh boy! But yeah. to properly demonstrate their fine Christian outrage over such deviltry, the congregation gathered to burn numerous copies of the four book in J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series. And while they were at it, they also torched some Stephen King stuff, trash cans, some Eminem CDs. Which you know, if you ever heard Eminem, more power to him. But uh, <laughs> and videos of Walt Disney's Snow White. Yeah. Snow White! Yeah. Snow White! Okay, yeah. Why? <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> this has got to be good. How perceptive these folks were to see through the facade and recognize the demonic and subversive nature of Disney and his machination of evil. The brazen vixen Snow White. <laughs> the little Trump should have known better than to take out residence with seven small pudgy men. No, wait a minute. Who's saying this? Is this, is this the reporter having fun? This is the fun reporter with having fun with, oh, all right. oh, okay. with the uh, oh, reporter's okay. name is Kathy Barely okay. from the uh, Telegraph Herald in Dubuque, no, Indiana. The, the actual the actual hostility between the fundamentalist Christians and Disney comes from the fact that the Disney Corporation decided to extend mm -hmm. uh, same sex uh, benefits. Same sex benefits. Oh, yeah. To, to their employee, right? So, Same for all of a sudden, all the cute little cartoons, Bambi employee. is now something demonic. Right. We have, we have uh, a talking deer, so I'm not... Because... <laughs> he does have the horns. Corporation, <laughs> because the corporation that, <laughs> that, that put out a film is doing something they don't like, <laughs> therefore, all of their products are inherently evil and need to be burned. Uh, okay. But uh, that, uh, that, okay. I read this article. I got this article from my crack research team, which also happens to be my girlfriend, <laughs> who's an abundantly at finding stuff on the internet than I am. Uh, so yeah, we'll have her on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah she can find stuff, you know, because I'm sitting here pecking on the computer and my limited. Is your computer actually working this week? I it works this week. Yes, okay, good. I fixed it, and uh, um, so I got these. But I read this story and I about rolled out my chair. With the quoting, quoting Jack Brock as saying that Harry Potter was this, is the devil and he is destroying people. <laughs> and I was going to do it in some kind of devilish voice, and I needed some thunder in the background to make it more, <laughs> more, more dramatic. But. And he calls, <laughs> Snow White, he calls Snow White a brazen no, vixen? No, no, that's the, that's that, the reporter. No, the reporter was having, okay, having okay. fun with it. So, but, yeah. uh, okay. but still, the, the article was just hilarious. Uh, 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 unbelievable. Oh. But there, he's not the only one. There are plenty of no. people out there who think that you know, because uh, they're because of their religion, normally the fundamentalist variety, that these just absolute fantasy stories are are somehow corrupting children's mind. Well, the only thing that Harry Potter has done is get children to read. And we can't have that. <laughs> no, 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 no. People actually read the Bible; they oh, find out what's in there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they've done things like because uh, you know, there's things in the story that are ethical issues, such as humility and, and responsibility. Oh my gosh! And how, how does the reporter put it? Uh, what was it? Uh, mm, responsibility. Now there's a dark and ugly thing to foist on uh, to foist on unsuspecting <laughs> children. Now this this this, uh, this brings up another thing I, I wanted to mention. Uh, if any of you out there have ever read Philip Pullman's trilogy mm. of books called His Dark Materials, this is another British uh, uh, children's literature um, series. That uh, is not has not gotten as much uh, popularity as Harry Potter, but is uh, uh, a higher reading level than the Harry Potter stuff. Hmm. It is basically a fiction about two little kids uh, the, from different uh, parallel worlds who are being hunted down by the evil church that that uh, serves an evil deity who didn't actually create the world but claimed responsibility for it. And uh, <laughs> and it turns out the reason the church wants him dead is that at the end of the story, I'm going to give away the ending now. I'm sorry if you don't want to hear it. <laughs> turn off your speakers for 15 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> at the end of the story, the two kids have got grown old enough that they fall in love, have sex, and they re they they like repeat the fall of man, and that's part of a step toward humans becoming liberated from these oppressive supernatural tyrants, right? <laughs> it is a atheist fable, an atheistic fable, hmm. uh, or at the very least, an anti-religious fable. And uh, it has recent, recently received some major prestigious award in Britain, the name of which I've, I've okay. forgotten. Uh, but 
it's amazing to me that such a direct attack on the fundamental beliefs of Christianity is not getting the kind of negative backlash that Harry Potter is. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why. Is it because yeah, it's, it's, since it's at a higher reading level, they can't get their way? Uh, they their don't even bother right? to read Harry Potter before they criticize. Right. They don't read Harry Potter at all. But apparently, none of their friends are capable of reading through <laughs> Philip Pullman stuff. Yeah. And again, but, what's the name of Philip Pullman's story? The the series is called His Dark Materials. In the United States, the first book is entitled The Golden Compass. I think that I think the books, at least some of the books, have different titles in Britain. But okay. it, uh, the Golden Compass yeah. is the first book of the series. Harry Potter has a different title in Britain. Does it? Yeah, okay. the, the, the Philosopher's Stone oh, as opposed okay. to the Sorcerer's Stone. Hmm. <laughs> right. Oh, boy. Philosopher's too scary a concept. Uh, I, was, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. no, a fundamentalist can't stand philosophers because <laughs> yeah, they actually so. think. Are you guys ready for a short uh, rapture report? Sure. Oh, go for it. This is actually sort of an update, but I'm going to do it as, do it as uh, uh, the, uh, part of the segment where we talk about claims of the, the imminent... Um, uh, that, that the that the end of the world is going to come soon when they won't give you a date. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, soon. Uh, I, I reported. I reported on the Unarius Society on. Our, thank you. I reported on the Unarius Academy on our TV show uh, last year, uh, and uh, and now I've gotten this uh, this update. After 25 years of claiming that the Space Brothers would return in 2001. <laughs> The Unarius Academy has had to make some changes to its website. Their site previously <laughs> proclaimed, quote, In this year of 2001, the last remaining barrier for contact with human beings from another terrestrial planet will have been overcome. Let me guess. They changed it to this year of 2002. It's better than that, <laughs> oh. Russell. This is why they have been, I've moved them to the soon section. Now it says, in the near, in the near future, the last remaining barrier for contact with human beings from another terrestrial planet will have been overcome. They have eliminated the specific date and have now joined the ranks of, uh, well, uh, they've changed their claim from the specific year to soon, thus taking their place beside beside Jim Jones, the ancient Assyrians, and other two-bit con men. Those who predict the end times without being specific are simply milking the fears of the gullible without having the decency to face up to the consequences for their reputations if their specific claim turns out to be wrong. And, of course, this time we've caught them red-handed. So <laughs> that's just a little uh, uh, Rapture Report update on the Unaria Society. Uh, How do you they've spell gone from... that? Unarius? U... Is that U-N-A-R-I-U-S. The website, okay. by the way, in case you want to go check out the current version, is uh, the website is www.unarius.org, U-N-A-R-I-U-S, slash landing, slash index.html. Hmm. Space okay. Brothers kind of reminds me of the Wonder Twins on, <laughs> you know, on the on the old Space Super Brothers activate. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, um, uh, you guys got more? Else, I'm going to launch into the critical thinking thing for this week. Yeah, you might as well let's consider that. twenty minutes. All right, let's do. Uh, uh, last week we talked about replicability. This is a this is the, the tools of critical thinking. How to tell the difference between nonsense and uh, stuff that's worth taking seriously. Uh, last week we talked about replicability. If the evidence for a claim is based on experimental results, or if the evidence could reasonably be explained as coincidence, then the claim must be verified by independent observers who repeat the same procedures and achieve the same results. This week's critical thinking tip, the burden of proof. We've all heard about this one. The burden of proof always rests with the claimant, for the simple reason that the absence of disconfirming evidence is not the same as the presence of confirming evidence. If the absence of disconfirming evidence were sufficient proof of a claim, then we could prove any number of outlandish claims. Consider the implications of that kind of reasoning. If I claim that Adolf Hitler is alive and well and living in Argentina, how could you disprove my claim? Since the claim is theoretically possible, the best you do in the absence of ambiguous forensic evidence, of, excuse me, of unambiguous forensic evidence, is show that the claim is highly improbable, but that would not disprove it. The fact that you cannot prove that, li that Hitler is not living in Argentina, however, does not mean that I have proved that he is. It only means that he could be, which is not be saying much. Logical possibility is not the same as established reality. 
People trip up on this because of the obvious power of actual disconfirming evidence. If I claim to have a tiger in my kitchen, looking in my kitchen and not seeing any tiger will obviously destroy my claim. But just because disconfirming evidence is devastating when it's available doesn't mean that it's our only sensible means of evaluating the truth of a claim. In the absence of, a con of conclusive disconfirming evidence, we must be allowed to resort to an evaluation of the supporting evidence. If we can't do that, then we're stuck assuming that all claims are true until disproven, which leads to nonsense such as assuming that Hitler is living in Argentina just because it hasn't been proven that he isn't. This rule is frequently violated by proponents of paranormal and supernatural claims who argue that because their claims have not been disproved, they have therefore been proved. Theists, for example, argue that because atheists haven't explored every square inch of every conceivable universe, that they have no rational basis to reject claims of God's existence. And by the way, if Michael Shermer says the same thing in his book, he's committing the same logical fallacy. <laughs> Belief must be based not simply on an absence of disconfirming evidence, but on the presence of confirming evidence. It is the claimant's obligation to fur furnish that confirming evidence. Next week, we will discuss the rule that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And that's this week's critical thinking tip. Cool. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, so hear that, Harry Potter naysayers. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to have your supporting evidence. Okay? <laughs> you actually have to read something once. Yeah, in a that while. would be a good start. Right. Really? This is usually coming from people whose uh, primary reading material is TV Guide. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. What's on TV today? Yeah. Uh. Um, How do you spell Tuesday? <laughs> oh, last night uh, I saw an ad for something on the History Channel it was going to be a show about superstitions and the damage and danger that they pose to civilizations and I missed it I forgot all about it mm. it was on History Channel 11 o'clock mm. Central mm. last night uh, I'm going to I'm gonna uh, watch very carefully to see if I can get a repeat yeah. maybe I'll read that TV guy you guys usually <laughs> talking about just a second ago Another Ten Commandments monument is under attack. Oh, oh no. no. Yes, um, in Plattsmouth. Is this a Ten Commandments monument or an Eleven Commandments monument? I don't know. <laughs> this one is in Plattsmouth and uh, a lawsuit challenging the placement in a park. The, tri the trial public for the park? lawsuit, uh, yeah. Belongs to the, to the state? I, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same one because they're talking about there was 4,000 similar commandment, Ten Commandment monuments displayed in cities around the United States. Uh -huh, yeah. And I know that the uh, the Fraternal Order of Eagles placed a bunch of them in the 50s or sometime around there. Uh, the Fraternal Order of Eagles. Yeah, F-O-E. Foe. I find that highly amusing. <laughs> <find that highly, laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, Our foes have placed Ten Commandments monuments <laughs> all over the country. The trial uh, filed by the AC was to start uh, Tuesday of last week, but... Uh, Koff issued an order, Koff, I suppose, is the judge because it doesn't say that in here, okay. um, issued an order in Lincoln saying that he would take the matter under advisement and rule on the brief submitted in the case. It is the present intention of the court to grant judgment in favor of the ACLU. Mm -hmm. So pretty much they've already said that it's, it's a done deal. The monument's going to have to come down. Mm -hmm. ACLU alleges that the monument fails to maintain proper separation between church and state. The city says the monument has been around for 36 years. Yes, that is one of those. Uh, hasn't hurt anybody and should be protected by the First Amendment's guarantee of freedom of religion. You're freedom from, to practice your religion. Yes, you are. You're just oh, free to hoist there it on we go again. else. There we go again. Because there have uh, violations have been going on for so long, therefore they're not violations. Right. Sorry, dude. Yeah. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> That's almost like one of uh, Hitler's... There is no men. statute of limitations on violations of the Constitution. <laughs> Last year, the Supreme Court ruled uh, refused to review a lower court order that said the Ten Commandments display in Elkhart, Indiana, had to be taken down. The court's action let stand a ruling by the mark that the marker violated the constitutional boundaries between church and state. Absolutely. And uh, and I I, I, this, I don't know from, why we're fighting over this anymore. This has also been very well established in precedent all over the country. Mm -hmm. These things are violations of the Constitution. They should all frickin' come down. Well, now we have, last one of them. We have one sitting on the Capitol. Of the I know. Texas. And, and, uh, and uh, our, our David Clark, Clark is Clark working is, on that. By the way, I should mention, for those of you listening who are in Austin and can get the Atheist Community of Austin's public access show, 
where right. David Clark is now the co-host. Yes. Um, With Martin our Wagner. Martin Wagner, right? Yeah, Martin is out of town. Uh, oh, or busy or something. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what the yeah, exact details are. He's working on a film. Or working on his film, so he's taking a day off? I believe that's okay. right. Excellent. And uh, uh, so David will be hosting, hosting, and I've been invited to be co-host, and so I'll be doing that tomorrow. All right. Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> Tune in. I, I, yeah, I used to be on that show. I, I don't know. Starting out as a co-host. Started out as a co-host. Now you're a host. Now you're uh, promoted guest host. myself to internet uh, broadcast, <laughs> and now and I'll be going back to... Uh, to uh, to sit alongside David yeah. and, and be sure and along the story along the big story about the about the Ten Commandments monument. Be sure to visit David's website oh, yeah. www. com. Yes, that yeah. is his website it's about his com. effort. Dot, I believe it's dot com. Well, try. But try I think it works either, either way. Yeah, work. if it doesn't work. And it's number ten. Com. It's com. don't spell out ten. It's number ten. Yeah. So type in the number. And that is about that is about David Clark's efforts to remove the Ten Commandments monument from the lawn of the Texas. State Capitol. Capitol. Here in Austin. He which has 11 commandments on it. Yeah, he yeah. spoke briefly about this, I think, last week. And uh, apparently there is somebody else after the same goal. And they've That's hooked right. up. That's right. And there was so another effort to yeah, do the same thing. Now there's two of them working on this. And uh, it, it's going to be one of those issues where if he does get it into court, it, it's going to depend on how they rule. If they rule that it's unconstitutional, the monument comes down. if Because it's another district court. And if they rule that it... It's okay. Then you have a conflict between two uh, district courts, and that's destined for the Supreme Court, right? Because you can't have that conflict. Yep. So, and then we know the Supreme Court's going to shoot down. So, well, but, well, well, we don't know that for well, a fact. But yeah, we, we hope. do. It, we it, hope. It, it, what, does anybody happen? have any further information about this? I was watching CNN this morning, and uh, they uh, posted something about some Supreme Court justice is starting some morality program. Mm. Anybody heard anything about no, this? No, I missed this one. Uh, he's apparently uh, 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 worried at the lack of outrage by American students in response to the September 11 attacks. Mm -hmm. And so he thinks that we need to have some kind of national morality program. Lack of well, outrage. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know where any of this is yeah. coming from. Come that is that on. scrolled across what the bottom you, of the screen uh, in one of those... What do they want? Students running and chanting in the streets? I don't know. Yes. That's why I'm asking. from Michelle. Oh, good. Yes, Michelle. David has hooked up with a lawyer who has already filed a suit in court to have it removed. Yeah, that's yeah. the guy that Mary was talking about. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, I didn't, yeah. Um, so. Well, back to school. We have a little time left. Um, the Georgia the Georgia legislature uh, school pray, school prayer debate is resurging, and the the September 11th has prompted a new round of bills. Uh, according to this article, the idea of putting a little religion back into the public schools is seeing a revival in the legislative session since the terrorist attacks of September 11th. One Senate le uh, leader wants to set aside three minutes each day for students to express their religious views and experiences. A bill sponsored by a House member calling for letting officials use materials with religious references in school. A third legislator Friday suggested that the General Assembly Revisit its law manda mandating school days start with a moment of silence to ensure children can pray. Okay. Like, they need a moment of silence right. for that. News flashes. <laughs> News flashes all around. I know. <laughs> but there is no need for a special three minutes for kids to express their religious views. Kids are free to express, express their religious views in schools any time on their own time at school when they're not being disruptive. Right. There's no need for such a bill. Right. Nor is there a need for a bill to have a minute of silence at the beginning of the school day, because all day long there are occasional silent minutes where kids can do whatever the heck they want, including pray. What was the middle one? Well, um, this is Representative Randall Mangum, yeah. uh, as a Democrat, who, who says, surely September 11th helps our case. Yeah, but what does he what does he want mm -hmm. to have happen? He wants to ha he wants like to have the three minutes put it back. To no, no, no. What was the one about about uh, religious references in school books? Uh, it's, it's no, that was not me. That was that was her. Mine no, was no, no, no. You read you just read three of them. You read three different bills they're trying to get in. One was the three minutes. Three minutes one was the three one minutes of silence, day. and the third one was something about uh, references in school books. Let's see. Mm. I don't have no. A that was mine. That was, was it? Yeah, yeah, that was mine. That the was judiciary. Uh, that was out of Washington State. Okay, I've gone insane. Senator, <laughs> Senator Jack Hill, uh, a Democrat, and these are all from Georgia as far yeah. as I can tell, uh, chairman of the Senate Higher Education Committee, has already been told by lawmaker, lawyers 
that his bill calling for religious expression in school will bring a court challenge. Under the bill pushed by Hill, who passed the Georgia's Moment of Silence law in the mid-90s, local school boards could authorize a three-minute period each day for students to speak about personal religious and uh, religions and experience. Ideally, students would be allowed to express their views on a rotating basis when it is their turn, kids could choose to be quiet and not say anything. It's not school prayer, it's religious expression. Well, we're going to be quiet and not say any more things because our time has run out. Oh, no. Uh, or, or, it's, or it's about to run out. Yeah. Uh, well, right. go, go ahead and finish off your but, point. You know, what this says, what this really says, if you read between the lines, is that if you're an atheist and you're going to school, when your turn comes for the moment of, uh, for your three minutes to, yeah. to express your religious view, yeah. you better be quiet. Because you know what happens if you if you're the if you're the sole uh, atheistic atheist student in that school and you come up and say hey you guys are all full of shit and my <laughs> advice is bring a Game Boy and play it and make the kids who have chosen to pray jealous. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's or if, if we have a brave atheist student who goes up there and says well you know my my personal uh, views on this is that you're all completely full of shit. Do you think that after an atheist says that, that that discussion is going to be confined to any three-minute period? Oh, no, no, no. No, no. no. that is going to start a religious war at that school right. where the whole thing turns into the... How can we bash the, this poor atheist kid? That's mm -hmm. right, that's right. And, and I whatever still, few friends he's got. Right. I, I still remember being in the band in high school and, you know, playing clarinet in the stands, and there we had moments of silence before we the had game. Moments of silence and that was the most uncomfortable too. feeling. I just felt sickened by it because I didn't know at that time that I was an atheist. But anyway, we're about out of time, so we'll finish this discussion next week. Yeah, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, uh, well, once again, I want to thank you all for tuning into our show, and here's our closing music. Bye-bye.